All right, welcome everybody. My name is Donovan Pyle, and uh, this is your, your weekly introduction to employee benefits for busy executives. And it's quite timely being that, uh, you know, about 65% of businesses renew their benefits uh, January 1st, which means that a lot of companies' um, renewals on their health insurance are coming out at the beginning of this month. So uh, it's, it's quite timely. And what we're going to do is cut through the fat and really give uh, executives the information that they need to, to turn the tide and help them maximize the return on their benefits investment, deliver more value to employees, um, and, and reduce costs. And, and these things are entirely possible because as of right now, most companies waste 25% of what they spend. And so that's a huge opportunity. Just a couple quick um, success stories from recent clients in the past couple of weeks. Um, one is from a nonprofit whose uh, healthcare costs, like many of you, have been just skyrocketing year over year, and they keep on having to water down benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, through our procurement process, we were able to find them a couple options that actually reduce costs and deliver more value to employees. One of them is about 28% below current, and that equals roughly uh, almost $4,000 per employee with much better coverage. But anyway, um, let's get started. It's, it's 12.01. And again, this is your introduction to employee benefits. Let's move on here. And just, just a, a warning, you know, the things that we're going to show you today once you see it, you're not going to be able to unsee it. Okay. A lot of people are frustrated around, you know, how does health insurance and healthcare work? What are the differences between those things? What does it all mean? How does it work? And they get frustrated by this. So we're going to pull, pull the curtain back and expose a lot of things as to how they work so that you have the confidence to make more effective business decisions. We're not going to make you sign a waiver, but maybe we should. All right. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Donovan Pyle. I'm the, I'm the CEO and founder of Health Compass in Orlando. We're a fee-based benefits consulting, procurement, and management company uh, working with mid-sized companies all across the United States. I'm also the chairman of the Validation Institute's uh, Certified Health Value Professional uh, Advisory Board. We provide the leading education and certification uh, on health plan innovation for uh, benefits professionals and uh, HR executives. Um, I'm accredited by the Validation Institute, and I also hold the highest designation awarded by NABIP, National Association of Benefits and Insurance Professionals, and I also hold the highest uh, certification issued by SHRM, which is for HR professionals. All right, so why does this matter? We're all you know, living in a world of fluctuating capital markets, tightening labor markets in many cases, and rising operating expenses almost across the board. And healthcare has been that way for decades, and most people don't realize that you can actually do something about that. So we're going to talk about that. All right. So why do we, let's 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 step back and, and talk about from first principles. Why do we even offer benefits in the first place? Right. Going back to coming out of WW two, uh, basically the government gave tax advantages for companies who were offering benefits as non cash compensation. That's how this whole industry got started was because of tax advantages. All right, so you know, if you're here in Florida, a dollar invested in benefits might equal somewhere around a dollar twelve invested in wages. All right, so if you do this really effectively, um, it's the best way to attract and retain talent. If you're not really sure how to control your healthcare supply chain, your benefit supply chain, it's really not very effective. All right, so what is a when we're talking about a benefits package for the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about health and welfare plans. So we're talking about your, your medical plan, your dental, your vision, your life, your disability. We're going to focus almost exclusively on the health plan because that's typically the, the third, you know, a top three expense and the fastest growing financial risk on many corporate PLs. So that's what we're going to focus on. So here's a snapshot of your your healthcare supply chain. Here are the layers that you most employers have to go through and are going through to get what they really want, which is healthcare. So they go through brokers because they typically don't have the in-house expertise know, to know how to finance and procure healthcare effectively for their organization. So most employers use a broker of some form, fee-based or traditionally, a, you know, a commission-based and bonus-based uh, broker. And and so that's the first layer. So they're supposed to maximize the return on your benefits investment. That's what they're supposed to be doing. That's not usually the case, but that's what they're supposed to be doing. 
Secondly, um, brokers go to insurance companies who, you know, traditional brokers get paid by insurance companies. So you've kind of got, kind of got the fox guarding the hen house here. And that's a challenge. And then insurance companies set up contracts with what you actually want, which is healthcare services, right? So uh, uh, facilities, uh, surgeries, labs, imaging, prescription drugs, these are the services that you actually want to buy, but you have to, you know, most companies are going through all of these layers to get there. So that's a, that's a broad overview of your healthcare supply chain. There's lots of nuance in there, but we're, we're not gonna go super deep today. All right, now unbeknownst to many people, you know, lots of the health plans that employers are still using today in 2024 were actually developed in the 1990s. So, you know, uh, you know, if you were driving a car from the 1990s today, you probably wouldn't be too happy with it. It probably wouldn't do meet your expectations. But with you know, our second or third largest expense, many employers are still driving this somewhat antiquated vehicle uh, developed in the 90s. All right, so let's talk about what a health plan is. Let's, let's, let's go a layer deeper and talk about the foundational pieces of a health plan. So the foundational pieces are you have a plan administrator who actually executes your plan document, your contract. They're the ones actually executing where the money goes payable based, based on your contract. Um, you've got your stop loss insurance. This is the insurance component of your health plan. Notice I use the word health plan because health insurance, it's not really, health insurance, health plan isn't really health insurance. There's an insurance component and that's the stop loss piece, but the rest of it isn't really, doesn't meet the definition of insurance. So anyway, stop loss is the insurance piece that actually caps your annual and monthly exposure. So that's a super important piece of the pie. What else do, do most health plans have? You typically have a network, a PPO network, an HMO network, an EPO, et cetera, POS. And a network, you know, when most people talk about networks, they think about the network dictates where um, my employees can go for care and be deemed in, the, in network or covered, right? But, and that's one piece of it, and that's an important piece of it. I would argue the even more important piece of a network is that the network is a contract between your plan and the healthcare providers, and it dictates how much your plan is going to pay the healthcare providers, right? For facilities, surgeries, labs, imaging, drugs, et cetera. This is a really important thing because, you know, for companies that have, depending on your state, 50 to over a hundred employees, your your you your company is actually the one that pays for healthcare. So the unit prices of the services that your employees are using really matters. Okay, it's the it's you the company and your employees that actually pay for these things. It's not really it's not the insurance company. Insurance companies actually don't take on a whole lot of risk. So this is a super important aspect to keep in mind. Lastly, you have your pharmacy benefit manager and you, they're called, you know, in short, they're called PBMs, right? And you've probably heard a lot about PBMs in the news recently. They're supposed to be administering the drug supply chain. Okay, so you've got your medical supply chain and then you've got your drug supply chain. These are two buckets of expenses that have different administrators. More on that in a second. All right, so let's look at how premium dollars are allocated. So, so for every premium, dollar in premium that you spend as an employer, let's say if you, know, if, you, if you have a thousand employees on your plan, you might be spending about 90%, 90 cents on every dot premium dollar goes towards variable costs. And those are again, in the form of medical claims and prescription drug claims, right? So every dollar that you use goes right out of your budget, okay? Um, and then on the other side of the scale, we've got our fixed costs. And the, the fixed costs includes things like plan administration, your stop loss premiums inside of the plan, and broker compensation, all of those kinds of pieces. So if you're trying to focus on, you know, if you're trying to control your costs, the biggest lever is by far on the actual, um, the variable cost side of the scale. So that's on controlling the, 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 the unit costs of the medical claims and prescription drug claims. All right. Again, you know, as I mentioned, I'm going to repeat this because it's such an important foundational fundamental uh, piece of knowledge that a, a lot of employers aren't really hip to. And that again, is that 
if you have over 100 employees on your plan, you are experience rated. And even if you're fully insured, your company pays for the healthcare services. Insurance companies don't take on a lot of risk. Your company pays for these things. So the unit prices really matter. All right, so let's talk about how health insurance rates are created. Let's let's put on our underwriting hat for a second here. And there are certain things that you as an employer, you really don't have a lot of control over, okay? So let's talk about what these are. The age of your employees, you don't have a ton of control over that. The zip code that they live in, you don't have a ton of control over that. What sex they are, you don't have a ton of control over that. And I would argue that in, in a broad sense, you don't have a ton of control over their health conditions, right? When you hire someone, you don't really know what you're bringing in, what kind of health conditions they may have. And that's okay. Um, but let's talk about the things that you really can control. You can control the unit prices of the facility fees, the surgeries, the labs, imaging, and drugs that your, your employees are consuming. You can control the procurement method. You can control to a large degree, the, the amount of um, waste, fraud, and abuse that's in your plan. And you can control the financing method. Are you fully insured? Are you level funded? Are you self-funded? You can control all of these things. And these things really make a big difference. Okay, so um, on this slide, what we're really talking about here is, you know, if, you, if, you, if we look from the insurance carrier's perspective, on publicly traded insurance companies, um, the items in yellow are the revenue streams that they used to have before the Affordable Care Act went into effect in 2011, 2012. So before the Affordable Care Act in 2012, and health insurers made money on plan administration, they made money on the stop loss profits, and they made money building out their networks. Okay, so there was three main revenue streams. Since the ACA, came into effect and you know, the ACA basically went to the insurance companies and said, listen, you guys are, the government said, you guys are making too much money. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna cap your margins through these medical loss ratio rules. We're not gonna get into the details here, but the insurance companies are very smart. They said, all right, are you gonna cap our margins? Here's what we're gonna do. We're going to buy up the supply chain, the supply side of the equation. So we're gonna vertically integrate and we're gonna do that by buying pharmacy benefit managers. We're gonna buy physician practices. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, they're actually creating, some of them are actually creating their own group purchasing organizations where they're selling materials to the hospitals. Okay, so they've discovered, wow, it's, it's actually much more profitable to be in the supply side of the equation than it is on the insurance or on the demand side. So that's the, that's the world that you're living in as an employer, and you need to know how to get around that, all right? And we're using United Healthcare just as an example, but if you pulled up any, you know, the, the earnings reports uh, on any publicly traded company since the ACA went into effect, um, publicly traded health insurer, that is, it very similar results. And that's because they've vertically integrated, they're, they're, they, they, <laughs> they know how to play the game around the regulations and hey, it just makes sense. That's, that's, the, the, you know, that's the game that's been set in front of them. All right, um, one thing that, many employers also don't fully understand is that, you know, despite all this money being spent on health insurance and health care, uh, medical error is actually the third leading cause of death in the United States. So by the most conser conservative, conservative um, numbers, about 280,000 people uh, die from medical error every, every year in the United States. And you know, I, I, I like to say it's, it's almost like having a pandemic, only nobody talks about it. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. And we've all you know, known people that have been negatively impacted by the medical industrial complex. It's nothing personal as far as the people, you know, the, the nurses and the doctors. It's just this system that a, a lot of them operate in. And so again, you as an employer, you need healthy employees in, or, in order to help you, you know, meet your business objectives. You want to make sure and do everything you can to make sure that you know your employees are getting high quality care there and they're not being harmed by the medical industrial complex. All right. So and, you know, again, why do we 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 have these programs so that we we attract and retain the talent we need to meet our business objectives? But how is that actually 
working for most employers. Now, you know, correlation is not causation, but if we look at the left-hand side of the screen here, we can see that, you know, employer premiums and deductibles have risen way faster than workers' wages since 2010. And so you've got a huge inflationary pressure that's been going on for years long before it was fashionable to talk about inflation. <laughs> um, every other, you know, the rest of CPI was operating under 2% a year. Uh, medical inflation was, you know, north of six, seven, eight. You know, if you're a mid-market employer, north of 10% year over year on average. So, and, and then on the right side of the screen here, we can see that, you know, employee quit rates have also risen dramatically since 2010. So there's something going on here and all these things, you know, again, correlation is not causation, but there's something going on here. And we, I think it's safe to assume that when, you know, when, when half your employees are feeling poorer every year, they're not, they're not happy. They're looking for something else. And health insurance inflation is a, is a big reason for people fe feeling poorer every year as those deductibles, as you can see on this chart, continue to rise every year. All right, so let's take a step back and, and talk about who wants what. You know, if we look at the supply side and the demand side, who wants what as far as healthcare prices goes? So if we look at the, the supply side, obviously they want healthcare prices to rise every year. So, you know, large health systems, uh, insurance companies, and the insurance companies' distribution partners, which are large brokerage firms for the most part, they all benefit from rising healthcare costs. Now, you'll see, you know, um, uh, large insurance companies have a public fight with, with health systems every 15 or 18 months when their contracts renew. And this will be in the media and there'll be lots of people getting upset that, oh my God, I'm going to lose my doctors, blah, blah, blah. And of course, they 99% they, they, of the time, they always settle in the 11th hour. And it's almost, and it, it's because at the end of the day, they both benefit from rising costs. So they'll, they'll point the finger at each other, but they, at the end of the day, they both benefit from rising healthcare costs. And again, it's your your company that pays these healthcare prices. Your company pays for healthcare, not the insurance companies. Okay, so on the other side of the equation, you know who wants lower healthcare prices? Well, obviously employers want lower healthcare prices. Uh, patients definitely want lower healthcare prices. Um, Fee-based benefits consulting firms who get paid by the employer, not by insurance companies or vendors, want lower healthcare prices. And then, you know, there's all these point solutions and some of out, point solutions out there like, you know, diabetes solutions and, you know, different wellness programs. And, you know, depending on their business model, they also want lower healthcare prices. So, so understanding the business model of, of the vendors inside your supply chain is a really important aspect of reducing costs and providing more value to your team. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, and I'll reiterate here because it's so important to understand this, 25% of what most employers spend on healthcare is complete waste. You're overpaying by 25%. That equals roughly $300 billion a year completely down the drain or $2,500 per employee per year that should be on, you know, in your bank account as a business in profit it's being wasted, massive opportunity. So, and so why is this happening? Well, first reason, companies pay for, if you're on a health plan developed in the 1990s, you're absolutely paying for healthcare services that your employees never actually consume, all right? I mean, by some estimates, around 90% of, of claims have errors in them. It's a big deal, all right? It's like going out to a fancy restaurant and the bill is just riddled with errors, but nobody's actually checking the bill before they, they, they put down their credit card. So that's a big lever. Stop paying for things that you don't actually consume. The second big opportunity is to stop overpaying for the healthcare services that your employees do consume, right? So right here in Central Florida, you know, the, the price variance for healthcare services is about 1,100%. You think about that, that's just, you know, you compare that to anything else that we consume, that's unheard of. You would never see that much price variance. But here in Central Florida, you can get, you know, you can, your employees uh, may be buying MRIs for $6,000 a pop when they can get an MRI with the same machine down the street for $600. And again, no matter if you're self-funded, level-funded, 
fully insured. If your company is experience rated, you have over 100 employees on your plan, this directly impacts how much your program is costing you. Okay, so why do we uh, go? Let's let's go back to well, who's in charge of like managing all of this, right? Who who is the general contractor managing this program? Well, it's supposed to be your benefits broker. Your benefits firm is the one that's supposed to be managing this, so you don't have so much waste in the system, so that you're maximizing the return on your benefits investment. You know, employers also lean on benefits firms to help keep them compliant. As we've seen over the past few years, there's been just a, a ton of a new you know. Re, re, reporting requirements out there. So you rely on your benefits firm to make sure that you're staying compliant. Now they might not be the ones actually doing the work, but they're going to, they should be connecting you with, with ERISA attorneys who will help you stay compliant. Um, employers also rely on benefits firms to help educate their pod, population about their programs, increase engagement, increase the, you know, the, the effectiveness of how employees are using the programs. If you have a program in place, like a center of excellence program in place, where you know if, if, if they get a knee surgery done at a center of excellence, that the employees pay nothing out of pocket, and it saves the employer money, and it saves the employee money, and they probably get a better health outcome as well. Well, if they don't know about that, they might not use it. So education is a big, an important piece. And then lastly, also very important for the, your HR teams is reducing administrative work. There is a ton of administrative work associated with benefits programs. And you know, if your benefits firm isn't helping with that, streamline those processes, helping with el eligibility, creating file feeds, just process in general, it's a big opportunity. All right, but you know, as we've seen, you know, and, and we, you know, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. We just had a, a released an article in, in the Orlando Business Journal. And the, the line that I led with was a great Charlie Munger quote. And of course, you know, Charlie's got many good quotes, but the one I cherry picked for my article was, you know, show me an incentive and I'll show you an outcome. <coughs> Pardon me. And so the challenge with the, the, the benefits brokerage industry is that brokers actually benefit from rising costs, right? So, you know, they're distribution partners for insurance companies and they actually benefit when costs go up, not down. And so if you're relying on your benefits broker to help you maximize the return on your benefits investment each year, you got a big problem. It's no wonder that you know health healthcare and health insurance is the fastest growing financial risk on most corporate P&Ls. So that's a big challenge out there. All right, and you know, in our opinion, this is a key reason why employers waste about $2,500 per employee per year on their program. So what's the impact of these you know, misaligned vendor incentives? So it starts with your benefits firm. If, they're, if their financial incentives are misaligned with yours, you're gonna have rampant health, health insurance inflation like many of you have been experiencing. You're gonna suffer lower margins, lower wages, slower growth, lower retention, lower productivity, more administrative work, and this more admit this higher amount of administrative work leads to more tactical decision making by HR teams. They just they have so many other things they have to do, and if they're not getting the right support, and you've got the fox guarding the hen house, um, you're just not going to have a good outcome. You're going to have runaway inflation on your second or third largest expense. So, you know, one way out is, you know, if you're going to continue using a benefits firm, consider using a fee-based benefits firm because this fee-based benefits firms basically took a note from the 401k industry when the fiduciary rules went into effect in around 2006. And so rather than getting paid by vendors and having this financial conflict of interest, fee-based firms don't accept compensation from vendors associated with the health plan. So that means they don't accept compensation as far as com uh, commission. They, they don't get paid commissions and they don't, and really just as importantly, they don't accept bonuses or, you know, loyalty bonuses from carriers. Okay. Um, this is a really important topic that I, I think a lot of employers haven't been told about, even though by law, they're supposed to know exactly how their broker gets paid. A lot of brokers have kind of shied away from um, putting the, the, the 
uh, appropriate disclosure forms in front of their customers because they're probably a little bit embarrassed about it. But um, so anyway, with a fee-based firm, you get that alignment that helps you with the rest of your, your supply chain. Now let's talk about at a more granular level, what services um, businesses really need to run an effective program. And so on the left-hand side here, we've, 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 we've categorized these services into three different buckets. So the way I like to look at this is that it starts with consulting. What does that mean in this context? Well, that means, you know, consulting is a process, a data-driven process that helps the benefits firm understand who you are as an organization and where what you're trying to build, what your business objectives are. So who are you? What's your risk tolerance? What's your tolerance for change? What are your objectives? How does your, your benefits program support your human capital strategy? How does your human capital strategy support your broader business objectives? If you don't know that as a benefits firm, making product rec recommendations is essentially malpractice, right? You just can't be effective. So that's the, the analogy I use is that, you know, the consulting services are akin to being an architect. You're gonna, you're gonna develop a blueprint for what, what the employer is trying to build and then you, tur you turn into a general contractor in the procurement process where you're finding the best in class um, subcontractors to execute on your vision and, and build what you're trying to build. All right. So that's that's the procurement process. And by the way, if you're a mid-sized business um, and let's say you're on a traditional plan, blah, 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 uh, you may not know this, but there are actually dozens of carriers in the marketplace who are trying to would love to earn your business. That doesn't mean they're all right for you. But if you're only being shown a few different carriers every renewal season, you're missing a huge opportunity because you have if you're only getting three or four you know carrier options presented to you by your your broker, you're not seeing you're only seeing a small sliver of what's out there in the marketplace. And that's a big problem because it weakens your ability to negotiate with your existing vendors. And it's just, you know, you're just missing out on other ways, other innovative, other innovative things that are out there that might be appropriate for your organization. Lastly, after you've chosen your vendors that you want to purchase, right, which which health plans you want to purchase, then your benefits firm should be turning and, you know, they turn on their benefits management hat where they implement the program and then manage the program moving forward. So we've itemized a lot of the services that we think employers really need, whether they've known it or not. <laughs> but these are these are this is, a, this is a snapshot of the things that are make a uh, a benefits program run really well. And again, the marketplace is much bigger than most employers realize. This is just a small snapshot of some of the vendors out there that are competing for your business. There are many, many more. And so what does this all mean? Okay, so if you start moving in this direction, doing some of these things, stop doing other things, <laughs> then the opportunity is that for essentially for every 100 employees you have enrolled in your plan, you can save about $1.9 million in the next five years. Okay, so if you're getting ready to exit, this is really meaningful. Um, because, you know, if you if you if you're going to your multiple is is eight times times earnings this is this is big this this actually matters and i would say even if you're not planning on exiting in the next five years think about how much money you can save how much more profit profitable your organization can be and you can dump more money into sales and marketing and then grow even faster so that's the opportunity and again, it's time to evolve. I think we're, we're kind of hitting the wall here on, on a lot of the, the old ways of doing this. And this just, you know, we don't drive um, old LeBarons anymore for the most part, even though I, I kind of have a soft spot in my heart for them uh, as a teenager, but we don't drive those cars anymore because we have better cars. And so, you know, for many employers, it's just time to, to find a better car. All right, so with anything, you know, there are always challenges with change, right? And I would argue that even if you're, you're doing the traditional procurement and purchasing uh, method, uh, you're probably having to change every couple of years anyway. You might as well change to something that's gonna be more sustainable and deliver a higher return on your investment. So, you know, uh, it, it takes attention. It takes a little bit of focus. 
there's always going to be a couple, some winners and losers. You know, anytime you change a network, for example, there's always going to be a few people that complain. It's just, it's just the way the world works. Um, and then, you, you know, of course, you have to educate employees as well. But you know, you contrast that with the the, the challenges of not changing. You, again, you've got reduced profit margins, re, uh, lower business valuation, higher turnover, higher organizational stress, and a weaker customer experience. These things are all related. It's 12.30. I told you this would be a pretty, pretty snappy uh, to the point presentation. So if you'd like more information this renewal season on how to maximize the return on your benefits investment, if you'd like more information on how to increase value for employees, reduce costs, and improve your fiduciary standings, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard about some of these lawsuits with Johnson & Johnson and Wells Fargo, et cetera. If you want to improve your, your program, um, I'd encourage you to apply for a complimentary one-on-one -on -one benefit strategy session. Just join our wait list by answering 25 questions and um, we'll, we'll put you on the list and uh, we'll contact you when we have time to engage. But that's it for me. My name is Donovan Pyle. Thank you for joining today. And we will see you, you next want to time. Take a moment as I interrupt to inter enter or answer questions. Do we have questions? Yeah, we have quite a few questions. Great. Well, you're getting praise um, <laughs> from some supporters, but there was a question that in today's world we hear broker, agent, advisor, consultant all used interchangeably. Can you just uh, expand upon that? Is that really the case? Can you use them interchangeably? This is such a fantastic question, and this is a, a pet peeve of mine because I, I think as an industry, this is this is an industry-wide problem that we need to do a better job of defining what these words actually mean. Now, I've I've heard that in some states there are you know uh, you know uh, insurances regulated at the state level level pretty heavily, and I've heard that in some states they actually do a good job of defining these things quite well. Um, but here in Florida, where I am, that's not the case. And so, yes, these words are, are used interchangeably all the time. But I would say um, the standard and definitions that that's, uh, a lot of people are trying to move towards are that brokers get paid by vendors, right? So they get paid by insurance companies, either in commissions or bonuses. They accept compensation from vendors. Fee-based firms, and again, this is my definition. I think this is a, a, the definition a lot of um, people are, are, are rooting for. Fee-based firms do not accept compensation associated with the health plan. So no commissions, no bonuses, no overrides, no per script fees, none of that. And the beauty of that, uh, you know, as, as, as someone who owns a fee-based fee firm, is that we don't have to worry about what you know, carrier, carrier X's bonus program is this year. Uh, we don't care at all. It doesn't affect us at all. And it, it liberates us to give our customers objective advice, unbiased advice about how to maximize the return on their benefits investment. But again, I think this is an industry-wide problem. And uh, there's a lot of people out there you know, trying to solve for that. So I appreciate the question. There's also a question that we got on the website. When is the best time to switch to a fee-based firm? Yeah, great question. Um, technically, you can switch to you can switch your benefits firm almost any time throughout the year. I would say that there are definitely better times to switch than others. Um, so, if you want a really good customer experience, I wouldn't try to switch firms. You know, two months before your effective date, <laughs> uh, you're going to have a pretty rough experience, no matter what anyone tells you. Um, be, why? Because well, they're not going to have time to do a really thorough discovery process with you. The procurement's going to be rushed. The uh, the you know integration is going to be rushed, um, so I, I would I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. But anytime throughout the plan year, you can change benefits firms without it changing any of your lines of coverage, without it changing your rates, anything like that. So um, it's best to plan ahead and and choose wisely. And by the way, we do have a buyer's guide for employers on our website that uh, you can download for free. It's a uh, great document. It's about, I don't know, 40 pages or so. And it really helps you with the, the RFP process if that's the process you want to use for selecting a benefits firm. These questions seem pretty pertinent for this renewal season. 
I think you probably need to put together maybe a question and answer on your LinkedIn page. There is another question that just came through. Uh, what credentials should your broker and or consultant have? What should you look for? Yeah, so so this is a yeah, re really good question. And, you know, if I was an employer, I I'd want to know, does my does my benefits firm have the right incentive to achieve the objectives that I, I'm shooting for to do what I need? And do they know how to do it? Right. Do they have the right incentive to, to do it? <laughs> and do they know how to do it? So on the incentive piece, that's why, you know, again, we're biased, but we recommend the fee based model. We think it's superior to the traditional model. Um, and then on the do they know what they're doing? Um, so I would highly recommend look, making sure that your 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 the firms that you're considering that the the actual you know the people you're you're going to be working with day to day the benefits consultant that they um, are registered employee benefits consultants that's the highest designation awarded by NABIP the National Association of Benefits and uh, Insurance Professionals um, and or they are certified health value professionals. That's the highest uh, designation awarded by the Validation Institute. That's CHVP. Um, the International F for Foundation um, of Employee Benefits has a has, has a decent program as well. There's CEBS. I don't think it's nearly as robust as the REBC -E or the CHVP programs. But those are some credentials that I, I would definitely definitely recommend um, having as a baseline in your vetting process. Again, like. If you're if you're dealing with someone who simply has an insurance license, and you know we, we've seen this in the market where they're actually <laughs> they're advising employers on how to how to spend millions and millions of dollars each year, and you know they have basically two years of training you know that, that's that's been given by the states or not even that. Um, I, I I would think I would say highly recommends making sure that they have some additional accreditations. That's all I have for the peanut gallery over here. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And other than that, we will see you next week. Have a great renewal season. Talk to you soon.